everyone how we would approach this panel. Uh, Kanishka put things very uh, pithily um, when he said, Kanishka, where are you? <laughs> Kanishka was supposed to speak first, but um, we might have to change that order of things. Um, but when I was, uh, when we were talking about um, how we would approach things, Kanishka put things very pithily when he said uh, that uh, we're gathered here to talk about South Asian-ness, and so he wanted to talk about that, but he's also a painter, so he wanted to talk about paint. Um, and I think that that is sort of what's guiding everyone's presentations today, is the question, not simply of South Asian identity, but how, what's, what South Asianness actually does to drive uh, formal conceptual material and political uh, uh, sort of practice within the terms of the medium of painting. Um, because uh, Kanishka seems to be um, they're putting you last Sunday because of your computer. Um, <laughs> so, uh, because Kanishka seems to be MIA, maybe we can start with with Mala. Would that be okay? <laughs> Sorry. I'm willing Thank to go you. first. starting with sort of like the most recent thing. I finished this probably like two weeks ago, um, and it's called Monstrous Thoughts. It's a gouache on paper, something like, uh, it's big, it's sort of like that big by maybe six feet across. Um, and I feel like my sort of South Asian-ness uh, or South Asia uh, is not currently an explicit focus of my work. It's, it's one of many layers. Um, this is a detail. Uh, in the same way that my South Asian identity uh, is comprised of, you know, having a Pakistani father, a German mother, and I think very much um, being a native New Yorker, uh, which is a whole kind of identity in, it, in and of itself. Um, that's another detail. Um, my work tends to cast a very wide net uh, in terms of subject matter, sources, art historical references. Um, this one is called Runners uh, from 2016, and it's also quite large, gouache on paper. Um, and I don't know, I look, I, I've looked at, I look at really like, sort of a whole smorgasbord of, of things. Um, Indian miniatures a long time ago led me to Warner Brothers cartoons, led me to 17th and 18th century Japanese woodcuts, and I kind of swim in and out of all of these things all the time. Um, you can see a cartoon influence here in the sort of weird foreshortening. Um, you can see an, uh, an Instagram selfie influence in the in the sort of the, the big foot coming in to the to the image um, at the bottom. Um, I also have kind of a black and white practice and a and a larger color practice. So this is a piece um, 
from a book that I made that I finished in 2014, um, which is called Be Home Here. Um, and it was actually all about kind of being more accepting in my art practice and letting in all of the influence even more than I already do. Um, so moving between Grimm's fairy tales, my commute on the subway, um, dream imagery, excerpts from newspapers, uh, graffiti, all of that. Uh, this one's called Hitchhiker. Um, it's also gouache on paper, uh, probably 30 by 40, 20 by 40 inches, something like that. Uh, and this one is called Unexpected Lake, and it's also quite a large piece. Um, I sometimes use an airbrush in parts of my work, and sometimes a more painted, painted aspect. And that's it. So as Mala um, alluded to, she uh, very kindly stepped in at the last minute after it uh, turned out that Nikita couldn't take part. And so, um, and not only that, but came up first on the panel, so thank you. So Kanishka owes you a really big drink at the end of the day. <laughs> um, and so Kanishka, please uh, come up. I'm, I'm, I'm not introducing everyone because they're introducing themselves with their work, but of course you've heard lots from Kanishka already, so good. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, oh, lots of texts. Where are you? Come back. This, um... Don't take mine. This, um... <laughs> thing while he's getting ready, while it's absolutely stunning and beautiful, this setting, it's clearly not um, made, designed with artists' presentations in mind. So the next time we do this, and I really, really do hope that there is a next time, um, maybe we can have better light and bigger projections. Maybe, yeah, that would be awesome. There we go. Okay. So, I'll run through this fast. I think. Um, the idea of translation is sort of at the heart of the work I'm going to present here. These images are segments from an interconnected, multi-part, ongoing body of work titled Post West, which uses the translated mode as an operational model to explore those intersections that Prerna referred to of representation, craft, technology, architecture, and the gaps that occur in the transmission of information, the gains and losses embedded in acts of translation, so to speak, which function for me as useful metaphors for my practice in general, but this project in particular. Um, so this is a rendering for the proposal I made for the Asia Society installation, which is the first public viewing of uh, one of the sections of Post West 2 I and I. Uh, as I and I Miss Twice is a diptych, first in a sequence of six diptychs based on found postcard representations of Switzerland and Kashmir. Um, the images from the abstraction, as you saw actually quickly, the representational panel sort of yields a perfect copy, a twin, which is an abstraction pattern which is made under invented but very strict rules in the studio that ensure that both paintings share the exact same structural DNA but present visibly different um, surfaces. And then that abstraction is used to generate digitally a repeating pattern and ornament which is then sent out to specific craftsmen and fabricators to produce in multiple parts. There are three individuals I work with specifically, uh, two in Kolkata, one in New Jersey. And um, 
the multiple processes sort of hand woven cotton on a loom, hand embroidered silk, scanned and printed images and painting are then brought back together in my studio and supered together to make um, I and I translate in this in this case. And this is where, you know, the if you haven't seen the show, this reproduction really fails you because a lot of the content I feel is sort of loaded into the factor of the piece and its um, presence physically is, its materiality sort of really something that uh, drives the content and the meaning of the work, right? Um, and it's kind of generative that I and I translate, I and I, Others Hide, the last part of the series is literally the backs of the other piece scanned and reprinted on cotton and its colors reverse sort of kind of double negative. Um, here's some other moments about this uh, piece. I have a bunch of notes but I can't seem to quite find them in order. These are all part of the Kashmir series. Right, and, and kind of running through in opposite, in, you know, sort of addition to this kind of clear opposition between Switzerland and Kashmir, the starting point often is wondering about definitions of neutrality. Who gets to define what is neutral? How do representations of ideal place or landscape even gain currency? How did Switzerland get to the top of the mountain? Um, Underpinning some of these impulses um, is also the desire to neutralize hierarchies, obviously, between these different visual and what I see in pictorial traditions of weaving, textiles, ornaments, and of painting. You can sort of see this kind of twinning and doubling happening everywhere, a kind of constant this and that. I and I, of course, is patois for you and I, you and me, um, which is kind of irresistible because it suggests both, points both to a, a twin, but suggests no othering. Out of these diptychs and translations, I'm building these pavilions, such as the ones you see here. They're generated from patterns delivered from the I and I paintings. They're designed to be porous volumes filled with sound and with a photographic kind of carpet on the floor. Um, I kind of see ornament as functioning not just as an extraordinarily kind of supple mediator between architecture and geometry, between the spatial and pictorial, but also as an effective means by which to efface traditional figure-ground relationships, which are akin to kind of colonizer colonized relationships for me. So by equalizing this field, we're kind of attempting to efface that power structure. Um, and finally, one last thing before I finish, I just want to kind of say something, uh, sort of sound a cautionary note about collage. Um, across media, I found collage to be the kind of dominant pictorial ideology of the 20th century and its cousin montage. Um, all kinds of claims have been made for collage, including the fact that it has an invocation of a perfect representative of the kind of global world we live in. This is an idea I reject entirely. Collage, to me, is violence, and through this kind of cross-pollinating strand of painting, ornament, textile, architecture, and sound, I'm hoping to propose a productive and much more generative model of surface. One via surface, one that is representative much more of the frisian, the abrasion, and the overlap and the inconsistency, really, of the post-colonial city, which remains my major kind of driving force of my imagination. Okay? Thank you. <laughs> Very fast. Sorry. That was bad. Anyway, lots of images. I had to be especially strict with Kanishka because in the email chain at the beginning he was like, no one is allowed to go over time. Um, <laughs> next, we're welcoming up to the stage Shazia. Thank you.
So I'm going to go right into some of the imagery in the work because um, I've had opportunity to share my work in two other panels. Um, I, there's a lot of storytelling, of course. There's a lot of reference to the miniature. I think it's kind of important since we're revisiting like um, this, um, the introduction of, of the aesthetic of miniature painting, especially in the development of uh, contemporary American um, painter, painterly tradition, as well as return of the image. Like a lot of the emphasis on identity, all these things that were very pertinent in the, t in the 1990s and how some of that, mo my, how some of that um, interface uh, happens in my work and through my work. Those are, those are uh, things I hope we will get to talk about in terms of the um, contribution of South Asian discourse in the painting tradition. So, of course, um, my first introduction to, to my work was through the drawing center. So again, I, was, I thought I was doing painting, but it was on paper, so it was considered more, uh, more as drawing and less as painting though it's within the canon of the Indo-Persian miniature painting, and that, at that time, was not the prevalent um, premise. The prevalent premise was uh, literally the Euro-American canon, which dominated the field of painting. So in that respect, um, I was not that interested in, in uh, modernism and various iterations of abstract expressionism. Uh, not a derivative relationship to the to the West via painting. So this is something I was already doing in Pakistan, and it made very little sense for me to let go of it. But I wanted to work with it. But I also wanted to point here to a very androgynous space. So uh, the, the, these are the same works, uh, two stages. So what I did was reduce all the color out of the miniature. So it's all the white ink left as the editing tool. And then I basically drew the line over the male figure. And if you looked through a magnifying glass, you could see that it was still the male figure under the female. So this idea of sexuality started to evolve. And I think these were things which um, which started to happen because I was questioning uh, what is the process of locating one's relationship to tradition? How does ownership occur? Um, how, uh, what, how, where do you belong? What are you being excluded from? So one started to invert the relationship of center and margin. And uh, some of those, so those were the consistent strategies so of uh, dislocating framing devices to open up narratives of gender and identity. So artists like Eva Hesse, if I was looking at, I was also reading Fatima Mernisi. I was also reading Ismat Chuktai, so uh, with Slava Simborska. So these are very interesting binary notions. So it's not just uh, one thing. And this um, the space of the of the personal is coming from a multiplicity of spaces, not necessarily just about a politicized notion of identity. So I also started to think in terms of how to develop a personal iconography. What is that lexicon of imagery that will uh, that can be taken along as I developed a, a sense of of engagement with the forms. So some of that here functions in multiple ways. This was influenced by Parka Mitter's book, A Much Maligned Monsters. Eventually it becomes um, an image for MoMA. And here basically is Bronzino's Venus and uh, the Indian aesthetic as both outsiders of, of classical um, art. And uh, who is in a position of power? Is it? Um, 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 uh, both Mannerist and, and Indian aesthetics, so more on the 19th century uh, uh, engagement of, of uh, historical engagement of art. So once it becomes a, um, a banner for the projects at MoMA, it was more like which institution is uh, really the maligned, uh, who's, the, who's the monster, what are the aesthetics, what are the, the players that are left outside. and. Um, 
this type of interface started to happen a lot where I was uh, also looking at forms that were about women's empowerment, but the piece on the right, which is up at the Asia Society show right now, was a uh, work I was doing, I, it was a commission at a law firm in the 1980s, uh, 1998, 1999, and as I was developing the work, after September 11th, I was asked to remove some of the imagery, it was considered too violent, so I basically removed uh, my work from that context, and that the provenance of that piece is in there. Um, so, uh, so, so sort of, these are some of the topics which are the East India Company as a navigational tool, how the red, white, blue also is about colonial imperial histories and also struggle and fear and terror. So um, these sort of disruptions from painting into, into a media space are, are some of the other um, deconstructions of the form. Thank you. Sorry, we've got uh, Sandeep going last because he's got his own computer, just tech issues. But I'd like to welcome Tara to the stage, to talk, Tara Sabarwal, to talk about her work. Hello everybody, thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, I see, I am seeing this getting together where we are now as a sort of family getting together here and seeing where we are all at and in a way of using ourselves to the best potential going forward. Um, my own uh, work is very solitary and um, I will begin by saying that I grew up in India and with a great sense all the time of being, uh, being somebody who's in my body and somebody which is a much larger, freer thing. And this larger, freer thing is very happy and uh, feels the world and the smaller person that is me is very imprisoned in myself. And this is like a theme which is throughout my work and throughout my life and I've tried to come to terms with these two kinds of consciousness and the two kinds of reality that come out through it. Um, I went to study in Baroda and I think on the first day in Baroda I was sitting, uh, I met Nasreen Mohammadi who was a teacher there and we just connected on that, on that front of, uh, of like understanding this thing we wanted to do and um, I spent a lot of good time with her. So the idea of art was not, um, was a kind of unraveling, was a kind of like, you know, I know really who I am, and it's just a matter of taking the veils out. So this is a very Indian thing. This is a very Advaita thing, a very uh, uh, Indian Zen thing. So it was coming from that area. So I begin first with this picture, which was done um, when I first joined the Royal College of Art. I went as a student to the Royal College from India, and um, you see this image, right? So what you have here is a woman uh, with a glove puppet in her hand, and the glove puppet becomes a protagonist in the real world, but it's actually manipulated by somebody else, by another entity. So at the heart of my work is this sense of duality. 
growing up, I would always have this dream that I am somebody else is having a dream of me and I'm not really me and and then having these moments of like pure joy when I can feel outside of my smaller self. And I think images like this come from this experience of, uh, which I call sleepless, of being me, but then a larger me beckons me. And uh, another one called animal eyes, and they are, there's a figure inside of the eye, and it, like a multiple reality going on. Uh, another image of, uh, I, I've been painting a long time, so I've taken like one image every 10 years. So uh, this is of uh, somebody holding a, me holding me being held by another me, like the layers of an onion that I feel my consciousness is. And uh, 10 years further on, another one of like this profusion of reality going on, which is like a simultaneity of, of uh, a flux of time that I can flow in. So now I want to go right to the beginning. So um, can somebody help? Uh, so now I'll talk a little bit of my present work. This is just five images of like every 10 years. So uh, presently, I think uh, my work is more about just really like being in the moment with it. And I've come to this, I've had moments of working like this in between, but now it's like, uh, uh, this is where I am now. Uh, so I, I al I've always worked without any idea in my mind. Just have a blank paper and jump into it. So the idea is always like my body and my larger self knows where to direct me. I just have to listen to it. And uh, a lot of this is about listening internally and not listening from you. I mean, I see you seeing my work, but I don't want to use you as a mirror to see myself. I want to see myself myself. I want to look inwards. Uh, this has led me to have a very private practice with, with being in, kind of like in exile in three different art worlds. I like still show in India, I show here. I keep showing my work, but uh, there's a sort of exile. Uh, oh, I, oh, I, oh, I uh, in a way, um, I mean, I, I, I go on about the idea of fatal love again because it's a little bit like the Tara that I know and that lives in this world, in my body, is very limited. And I have to kind of, like, like the moth that has to burn itself in the fire to get out to real happiness, I have to burn myself to do that. So it's a bit like jumping out of an airplane. Uh, you have to uh, lose it to find it, and so, so these are, uh, these are, by the way, about 44 by 30. Um, they begin in a public space, I do them in a print shop, I then take them home, I look at them a lot, I scratch them, they're made up of shapes that are reminiscent, like this one could be like the shape of India, so it's going in the blind, it's a little bit like making something uh, my hand is making something and I'm being directed not by sight, but I'm being directed by something that comes through me. Uh, I don't have to say anything. <laughs> and then I have one etching. I do a lot of etchings too, sometimes because of not having a studio. And uh, this is the last piece. This is a drawing. Thank you. Thank you. In the, um, first of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. My name is Sandeep Mukherjee. I'll tell you a little bit about me. I live in Los Angeles. Um, are there any other LA artists here? Yay! <laughs> I know! Anyway, um, I, came to the, I came to the United States when I was 22 to study engineering. I worked at Texas Instruments, 
And then I quit everything and went back to art school, got to art degrees, and started making work, showing work, and teaching. Okay. Um, when I was an engineer, I had one project that I worked on. I want to just briefly say this because it sort of will tell you where I'm coming from. I worked on a NASA project called COBE. That was the first satellite that was sent out into space to measure the background cosmic radiation. Okay. It was a way to image the invisible. And for me, that has become sort of the directive of my work in a certain sense. The things we don't see, the things that are not there. Okay. The pictures are there. It's a little disconcerting at this time. Okay. Um, oh, no. Since my work is process-oriented and hot, it sometimes... Um, painting for me is a means or a technology to make an image. For me, an image is a slice of moving matter. So movement is really important. That Can you hear? So movement is very important in the work, both in terms of time, but also in terms of difference. Matter is just as important, and material entanglements are key because I think material has agency and subjectivity. So for me, identity is an image that keeps remaking itself through space and time. So I'm going to show you a lot of images because the work has morphed through many, many iterations. I'm going to show you three primary projects, and although the works have been shown, I consider them not finished or incomplete because every iteration of the work is a new work. Um, so the first work I'm going to show you is called Mutual Entanglements, and I'm going to start with some process images. The fold has been really interesting to me as a geometry, but also as a space to think about. So when I thought about, and I've been thinking about this for a long time, what does the smallest thing look like? What does the largest thing look like? What can that be? And I came to a point, a point, is a point the smallest thing? No, but if space and time are curved, it will be a fold. So I started thinking about the fold in both micro, macro, and in basically all kinds of contexts. So I, I was working on these um, on this show called Mutual Entanglements. There's no other. No, no, no. Is it going? Yeah, it no. It wasn't going before. Oh. <laughs> this will give you an idea of the engagement of the body in the work, because for me, what I'm trying to do, I'm thinking about, in this work, thinking about what kinds of invisible patterns the body makes as it moves through space. So there's an idea of translation or indexing the body in a certain kind of way. So the works were 10 mo um, modular panels, um, five feet wide, seven feet tall. There were 10 of them, okay? And I was thinking about the fold. This um, lady who was opening a gallery in LA came up to me and came to the studio. I said, you know, I need, a, I need a space where I can basically bisect the fold, 25 feet and 25 feet. A month later she called, she said she had a space and I had a show. So she basically built the entire space, 25 feet, 25 feet, for this piece. This piece was then shown two more times, and probably a few more times in two more iterations, and I'm just going to go through those pictures. So the idea of modularity or being malleable, the idea of iteration, and the idea that a work emerges every time, singularly. So that sort of multiplicity of what's going on is kind of constantly happening in the work. I'm just going to go through images right now because, oh, painting as chemistry set. When I talk about material entanglements, a lot of this work deals with materials that, I'm unopen, that I don't know how will react with paint, so I use a lot of household cleaning products. I'm kind of a neat freak. Cleaning, cleaning is kind of one of those therapeutic activities for me. So a lot of my work has bleach. Zeb. So basically, I have chemical interactions that are creating patterns and marks that are outside my hand. Basically, I'm the sort of the orchestrator of this movement. So these, this is this is the 50-foot piece, first iteration. This will give you a sense of the details in terms of what the chemical entanglements are, how the material basically acts with each other and creates itself. Too fast? Sorry. The body as the fulcrum. Hmm? Good speed. <laughs> okay, iteration number two. I was I was invited to do a piece for a library with a portal. And I thought this would be an amazing 
where you think of the image as an event or as, as an action that you're walking through. So I made this piece that became a portal. The same 10 panels got reconfigured. This is me on the floor of my studio trying to figure out scale relationships of my body with the piece because I, I'm always trying to imagine the other side far away. That's kind of how I work. And it's like a lot of it is about arriving somewhere close to it, but just far enough that something different starts to happen. So the idea of repetition with the productive difference is very important to me. So this is the installation of that piece. This is iteration two. This is the portal in the library. This is iteration three. We were invited to do a piece in this sort of shape called Cocktail Lounge um, at the Volta. Okay, this is the second project. I did, uh, I was commissioned by the top art. How many minutes? Zero minutes. We're done? <laughs> These were images of my weight that were uh, aluminum. I've been working in aluminum, so these are images that I got when they lifted me up and they basically created an image of my body weight in different configurations. That was installed in the gallery with the balcony, so it had to do with the image of gravity and how it reflects back, to, back up on us every moment, which we don't see or, or, or realize. This was the installation of the piece at the end. This is iteration number two. The pieces got all flattened out, and now we're using the image that was created to fold a new image. That's a, basically taking the image and recreating it over and over again. This is the, I'll just show this and I'll stop, because it's a really fun one. This is not finished, I'm gonna show this in Berlin. This is, the, this is called, um, Molting the Fractured Landscape. Basically, I made, I've done a lot of work which is like molting skin, so basically the image is by frottage, it's by rubbing, it's by physically coming in contact with the world. Um, and removing it, stripping it out, and keep making these skins. You know, like you said, veils, you were saying veils, I think with the same idea, but through skins. Okay? <laughs> I'm giving Sandeep a bum rush off the stage, but off the podium, but he'll still be up on the stage and hopefully we'll be able to talk more about these projects. He's still going through the pictures. Okay, come, <laughs> please come up, uh, the speakers, and then we'll and then we we can get going while you look at pictures. What? <laughs> the clock is ringing. So I, I just want to, um, as I was listening to everyone talk about the work and such amazing work on display, I, I was struck by Tara's use of the word duality, because I think that there's one thing that sort of developed in, um, I'm really into memoir um, and biography and how one narrates one's experience as an immigrant, whether first generation, second generation, or so on. And one of the things that I've noticed is that we often talk about being halfway here and halfway there, or ambivalence being the condition of, uh, of the immigrant, or falling through cracks, being neither here nor, and neither there. And one of the things I was struck by is a story, uh, is my daughter, who's 14 now, but when she was little, um, she used to say, when people asked where she was from, she'd say, I'm half Indian and half uh, German and half Irish and half Canadian and half American. And it was too complicated to explain to her how those categories actually worked in relation to each other. So I just let her be two and a half people, right? Like that was just it. And I, I was thinking about less about um, being half one thing and half another thing or being half here and half somewhere else. And, and the idea of being both, right? You're both here and some, somewhere else. And what does that idea of positionality mean? And I was struck by Tara's use of the phrase duality as opposed to binary. 
right? Binary suggests an opposition, duality suggests a both and. Um, and that, uh, that that seemed to run through so many of the ways that you talk about your work, that there's translation and mistranslation, that there's friction and a kind of smoothness, that there are categories where something can be painting and a work on paper, that something can be ornament and abstraction, that something can be architecture. I was thinking of the, 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 the bamboo and paper, um, if, you know, temples that you were showing or, or um, follies that you were showing. Something can be architecture and ephemera. Something can be popular art and fine art, right? That, that, that what we see in a lot of your work is the ways in which you're not working with binaries, but with dualities, that, that there's a, if you want to put it this way, there's a value added um, thing about the condition of immigrant, uh, or the condition of diasporic artist, or the condition of just art that's going on in all of your work that I think, um, oh, and, and that something can be visible and invisible, um, I think, came out, I think, in your work. So, uh, I have no question. I just, want, I just wanted to say that that, that sort of um, that, that that seems to be one of you know when we were talking about how we can, how each of our sort of identities informs the work or each of your identities informs the work that 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 seems to be a, a, a way of thinking through that's very specific to a sort of cultural multiplicity that I think uh, all of you bring to your practices, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. Sandeep, I'm gonna start with you. Great. <laughs> I think, um, I just wanted to make co one comment, is when we think about here and there, we often only think about space, but we don't think about time. So I think you have to think about experience both temporally and spatially, and when you do, then you find it's not so, so, so impossible in a way to, to sort of conceptualize at least. Um, so for me, I think the space and time are both key for this duality that we're talking about. Um, yes, so if we are talking about time, I think imagination is a very good um, idea premise of how imagination allows you to create a link to past and future. And by virtue of that, it can political act? Uh, I suppose simultaneity, that this and that, is, is very much a driving force in really all of my work, but particularly in the stuff I was showing you this, you know, the whole die for a reason. So, um, the, the drive to set up not that kind of binary, but between um, multiple presences, I suppose, simultaneously, is um, very much behind the philosophy of what I do. I don't know if any other insight to add to that. Um, Something for fun. <laughs> Hello. Yeah. I, well, I, I mean, one can keep talking. It's such a big central theme. But um, I think duality is the human condition. This is how I feel now. It, there is an opposition, and yet there is a peace one makes with the opposition. And um, uh, so there is, uh, I mean, like meditation, for example, is this very simple thing where you become aware of the two things. And in the aware, getting, the, getting aware of it, there is such release. So I think the trajectory that you arrived at, Aruna, to feel this, this is it, you know, to, to accept it and feel it is, is the big thing and to live with it. I want to also add to somebody who said something about uh, languages yesterday, that uh, 
language is another duality. Sometimes I, when I'm telling myself something, uh, I have to say it in Hindi as well to myself, and then I understand. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I was just thinking about how, as an artist, you're always um, you're engaged with your work over time. So, like you know, like all of us were trying to like zip through like multiple bodies of work because, of course, if you've been making work for you know twenty years, thirty years, hopefully for the, your whole life, you end up with so many things that you've gone through, and and some of it. You know, looking back, I feel like, oh, this is not relevant anymore, but then five years from now, I'll make something that directly references something that I made, you know, 15 years ago. And, and it's this continual sort of dialogue with yourself. Um, but it's also very much like, I don't know, I was thinking recently about sort of like the artist as creator, like we're all kind of, you're at the same time, you're, you're sort of like a divine personage, like you're, you're making all of these worlds. and and then you're also, though, very cognizant of the limitations of that and, and the limitations of visual communication and, and verbal communication and the fact that, like, you can't, you're never really saying anything specific in, it seems like in visual art, it's a much more open, interesting kind of medium than language, but it definitely intersects with language here and there. I mean, I just wanted to say that when you're dealing with the history of painting, which is so canonized in the West, it pretty much takes over any conversation in painting. For me, it's about really cobbling together my own way to make a painting. And whatever that way might be, whether it's, whether it's, I've made paintings with brooms, and painting products, and lasers, and whatever. So it's like finding a language that somehow, that is yours really important as an artist for me today because um, that is where the personal becomes the culture. Go ahead. You want to move? I just want to sort of reiterate that thought because I think it's important to kind of acknowledge that in, in many ways all of these practices are in some ways an attempt to enter into this larger painting discourse and finding very specific and different into it that hopefully upend the narratives that we all inherit. So, oh yes, I, one second, okay, because I just um, wanted to say as the idea of translation has sort of again come up, one of, one of my favorite, um, I don't know if it's my favorite novels, but it's one of my favorite ways of thinking about the world is um, Amitav Ghosh's Sea of Poppies. And what I love about that, for those of you who haven't read it, it's, it's, the, it's a story of sort of 18, early 18th century um, pirates, basically, <laughs> who go, and this sort of trade route that goes through, uh, along the coastlines. It's literally a liminal um, route that goes from America to Europe to around the coast of Africa and then around the coast of India to Hong Kong. And it is, uh, the crew comes along along the way, this is the first half of the novel, the crew gets on the boats along the way, creates a language um, from the pirates that are picked up along the way. So it's, you know, English and, you know, various African languages and, and various Indian languages and Chinese all get turned into this hybrid language. And Ghosh is a um, linguist, and so it's, there's a very, there's a precision, right? It's a historical language that he doesn't bother translating. So when you're reading the novel, right, you don't get, he doesn't translate what these people are saying. You are as prone to mistranslate their dialogue as, uh, each, as the characters are prone to mistranslate the dialogue. And yet a story emerges, a narrative emerges from this. And I think that, that this is one of the things that I think a lot of times artists from elsewhere are asked to take on the task of translation. Right? Whereas American artists are never asked to translate for an Indian audience or a German audience or whatever, right? But it's, but it's always the artists from elsewhere that are asked to translate for the Western audience. And, I, and I, so I love the ways in which um, mistranslation also plays a role in your art, like a refusal to accommodate that. Um, and I think that's really interesting. Can I just add one more thing to that? 
I mean, I think <clears throat> one of the challenges when you use the word translation, I think, is that it relies on the process of identification and identity. It doesn't deal with difference very well. And so, I think this idea of loss and that idea of difference is where we're navigating a safe place. We can actually have conversations on just a yelling match. And so, when there are moments of identity, we think, oh, it's a translation, but when, what, what, when there isn't, then what? And that's when the a difference actually can emerge. That's right. Is, I, I saw that there's at least one question from the audience, so if that's okay, yeah. Thank you so much. Shazen, the question's a bit for you, but also for the other panelists, because, you know, you tend to, you often work in miniature and small scale, and I'm wondering whether you ever felt the pressure to go large, because I feel like increasingly painting is sort of becoming a scale exercise, like they're just sort of getting larger in different kinds of ways, and I'm just wondering a little bit about um, the tensions you sort of perceived and like how people receive work that's sort of smaller as opposed to this sort of push towards scale. Yes, um, it, it, it was the first encounter that I had in 94, 95, where what I noticed was that the work that I was doing was not getting traction and it was being considered as a female aesthetic, it's, in, it's intimate, it's detailed, it's small. So all I did was took elements out of the work and painted them large, but they were on wall drawings positioned so they had traffic outside, this is in Texas at the four program, and the, the shift in reception was so dramatic. And I was questioning where, then what the iconography has, in, has a, what's the interface with the iconography? And then I was able to draw that attention back into the uh, scale, back into a smaller scale. So the pressures could, it was a strategy just as an exploration for myself, but in the art world, of course, um, scale is, has, uh, painting is completely hijacked by scale. And scale becomes essential, not just the scale, the labor. Like, what I also noticed was that the work that I did, if there was labor, then the labor had value. And that's how your work was being deemed. That's very tricky. So if I chose not to make a detailed work, people were like, oh, we're waiting till you do the miniature because I want to buy the miniature. You know, so there were all these other aspects of the art world that starts to um, um, create some kind of a uh, navigational system around art that is not necessarily coming exactly out of, out of the mold of, of um, contemporary practices of painting Western models. I hope that, can I say one more thing? I mean, I think you're seeing a very thin sliver of what we are showing you, and we've done very small, intimate works, and I think um, scale has been a result of wanting to escape the frame of painting, and, it, and it's become environmental, and now it seems like spectacularity is the only register of subjectivity that is possible. It seems like we're getting so stone deaf to anything that's subtle or quiet, just need loud big things, so that's the downside. But I think, as painters, we're well aware of that pitfall, I think we are, and we have to navigate a very tricky terrain between galleries and shows and personal growth, and it's a tricky business. Um, yeah, regarding scale, uh, growing up in India, we never saw any big paintings. They were always uh, small pictures we saw in books, all the world, world's art was seen in books, so everything was small anyway. And at that time, people weren't doing larger work because of many constraints. And, uh, well, about scale, I would say that there, it is a problem to show in galleries if you are working small and intimate scale, but there, there are ways around it. I have often made lots of pictures in a set, made uh, uh, pictures that sort of bounce off each other and become uh, a group. And, the things one can do with that. Also, like a lot of the art, a lot of the art is not made by artists. So, you know, then the, there's a whole factory making people's work. Uh, did you want to jump in on this? Um, is this thing working? Uh, I don't know. I think you, as an audience, you choose what you're going to look at and engage with. Um, 
if you like giant monumental painting, you go seek that out. Um, I think there's also, most artists kind of, you, there's even, it's not just scale that's like something that you kind of deal with, you also deal in a way with like uh, private and public, like your, your preparatory sketches, your really, really personal sketchbook that you don't, you show like three people, your slightly more um, finished work that you might show, you know, like people in your studio or galleries and then like, and it's always, it's sometimes people make things for different contexts and sometimes you just like, I don't know, it's like different artists, they can make different stuff. People make, just sit in their studio and make things and it can be big or small. We have one time for one more I want to say question. one quick thing oh, about that, sure. is that, you know, small work, uh, through small work one can present uh, things like vulnerability and things that cannot be presented in big work or, or it's not conducive for big work. So it says something about the world and what they want to see. One more question. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm wondering, uh, aside from the, um, the explicit aspects of your artwork uh, which you've presented already, um, what might be the other references, um, whether it's literature, music, or something else that actually fills you up uh, and enables your practice over all these years? Music, reading, dancing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, for me it's definitely reading is a big thing, um, I think stories and storytelling and being able to kind of sink into like a, a different narrative and a different world and, um, and then I also have a, 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 I try to, you know, because I have a job and I go to work, um, so I'm never in my studio as much as I would like to be, but part of what keeps me thinking about what I'm making is to have a sketchbook that I take with me everywhere and I like draw on the subway and I draw on the bus. Um, and part of that is then also like um, being aware of like all the little moments that, that you might, um, that art helps you notice, you know, like if you draw your alarm clock in the morning, it, it has a very different feel than when you hear it like ringing in your ear and you shove it onto the floor. Like, I don't know. So, so I feel like art helps like pinpoint moments. Um, and what I'm talking about is, I guess, like more diaristic in a way, and not like not like sort of a finished big thing. Um, but I think. So I wanted to just say that um, outside of what influences my process, painting for me is an interdisciplinary um, aspect. It's not a hierarchical thing. It's not purist. It's uh, it's uh, it's at the crux of um, of um, several languages and several differences kind of simultaneously coming into play, not as a synthesis, but as a multiplicity of, uh, of, um, of ideas and uh, even discourses, different languages. So like working um, with a composer, um, how that language becomes part of, a, um, of, of the work that I make, which can be experienced through a, a, through a projection projection into space that becomes participatory but still deals with a with the constructs formal constructs of that within the painting notion uh, can i answer um, definitely um, i mean this is the beauty of art that uh, it speaks to you directly about uh, something that you want, where you want to go yourself, and the hope is that we ourselves do art that speaks to others. 
so the piece that is and that I'm very close to right now is uh, Schubert's 960. It's his last piano concerto, and I'm doing a series of work on it. The work of the boats actually right in the end was about that. He wrote this piece when he knew he was dying. He died a month after it, and the piece is exactly about what I'm talking about. What I was talking about. It's about like the human condition coming to terms and grudgingly and then just the beauty, love, surrender that takes him somewhere else. So it's like it speaks to me and I'm doing a piece of the different parts of the journey from listening and so um, it's like a bounce, we bounce off other things and we hope others bounce off our. So, can I All of these things and walking and listening. Thank you. you can only talk about the world if you know how to be in the world. So um, we're giving Kanishka the last word, which rarely happens, actually. <laughs> but Prerna has asked us to be a little strict about time so that we have time for the next panel. Thank you so much. To the panel.